Okay, chapter 11. Let's talk about groundwater. What is groundwater? Well, it's what it sounds like. It's water in the ground. Uh, here's a nice image. I think this is somewhere in Arkansas. You've got uh, water coming out of a cave. Water coming out of a, a limestone uh, cave. Very pretty. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, I want to talk about, we're going to talk a lot about groundwater. It's fairly important. It is kind of uh, in the purview of geology because the ground the groundwater is flowing through the rocks and the rocks kind of dictate what happens to that groundwater. Uh, there's kind of like a special subsection of geology called uh, hydrogeology or hydrology uh, and, and this is kind of that that realm. But we'll talk a lot about this stuff, groundwater, uh, water tables. But what the water table uh, is, is it's just the surface of the groundwater. So when we talk about where the water table is, if it's three feet beneath the ground or five feet beneath the ground, it's just the surface of that water. It's where you hit uh, the water. And most groundwater, uh, it's either trapped between sediments in a uh, in a gravel, or even a, a uh, it can it can fill in uh, pore spaces within uh, sandstone, or you'll just have fractured rock, and the water will fill in. Uh, the fractures. Groundwater. There's a lot of groundwater uh, on this planet. Um, lies beneath the ground surface, filling in pore sediments, sedimentary rocks, and fractures, and other rock types represents 1.7% of the hydrosphere. And this sounds like a small number, but when you can consider that the entire hydrosphere is all the water, including salt water, uh, we're talking about a hundred times all the fresh water and all the lakes and all the rivers uh, combined. So the majority of the fresh water on this planet is groundwater. Uh, groundwater is resupplied through slow infiltration of precipitation. So you remember we talked about the uh, water cycle or the, the, the hydro cycle on uh, that last chapter. <clears throat> so this is again where groundwater is coming from is Water is uh, evaporated in oceans mainly, and it comes up onto land, and it rains, and that water then infiltrates into the ground. Uh, in general, groundwater is cleaner than surface water. That's because groundwater ends up kind of getting purified by running through sediments, uh, and also it's just it's down there for a while, and occasionally there's microbes, and the microbes can kind of work out any kind of uh, uh, contaminants that, that may be in there. But generally, uh, gra the ground acts like a giant sieve to sort of filtrate uh, groundwater. Uh, we access groundwater by wells. Um, wells don't have to be like, you know, the, the fairy tale thing where it's like six feet wide and there's, you know, Jimmy fell down the well and oh no, get the bucket. Uh, wells can be, you know, a, a two inch pipe. So you can take a two inch pipe and, and or a two inch diameter pipe that's maybe 40 feet long and we can stick it into the ground. Technically that's a well. <coughs> Uh, groundwater is extremely important. Uh, like I mentioned in the last uh, chapter, it's it's a big big deal. We all need water. We're still all beholden to water, and our uh, population is getting bigger um, throughout time on this planet. It looks like it's going to cap out. That's the good news. Uh, if we if this isn't uh, human geography, but the, if you look at human population, it looks like we're going to cap out at about nine to ten billion people on this planet. But even then. That's still a lot more people in there around today, uh, and they're going to need groundwater, and we're going to need to grow food for them, and that food is going to need groundwater, and so it's a, a big concern. And the uh, pollution can also impact your groundwater, so you don't, you know, if you get your water out of a well, uh, you'd be pretty annoyed if your neighbor dumps a barrel of oil onto his lawn, and all of a sudden uh, you've got the oil in your in your groundwater and then the water you're trying to drink. So pollution is a, a big concern of, of groundwater. <clears throat> so I've shown a, a similar image of this uh, in the last lecture. We've got all the water here in a sphere. We've got all the liquid fresh water on the planet. Uh, and then we've got all the, the, the water and, and lakes and, and rivers. So uh, there's not a whole lot of fresh water on the planet. It's a very finite resource. Who uses water? At least in this country, what do we do with, with all this water? Well, if you consider hydroelectric dams, uh, 
that's where most of our water usage is. But this is just the stuff that's going, you know, it's going through the rivers, it's going through the reservoirs, and it's passing through the dam. So it's not, you know, you can kind of argue we're not really using it. It's just kind of running down the river and, and we're just pausing it for a second and then sending it through a turbine to give us some electricity. So you can kind of knock off uh, this stuff. But water is important. We do generate a lot of electricity uh, from water. And then a lot of it is for irrigation, irrigation of crops. We use a lot more water to farm than we do just to drink ourselves. Because here's the public supply, that's just how much we drink. And there's uh, industrial supply and, uh, and livestock. And so. uh, this is kind of interesting, especially since we, you know, we're Arkansans, we live in Arkansas. So this is the total amount of groundwater withdrawal. Uh, it's back in 2005, but the total, it's probably similar today. Uh, the total groundwater withdrawal from each state, or from the entire uh, United States, kind of broken up in all 50 states. So the top user is California, and then followed by Texas. This this makes sense. There's a lot of people. These are very big states, one. Two, there's a lot of people in these states. However, we get down here to Nebraska, and then especially to us, Arkansas, we account for 9%. We are number four of all 50 states in groundwater usage which is kind of wild. Ar Arkansas only has about 3 million people in it. We're about 1% of all the population in this country, but we use 9% of all the groundwater that's taken out. Why is this? And it's probably not a very hard guess, but I still think it's surprising when you consider there's other states over here similar to Arkansas, like Mississippi or even Oregon. Oregon's a big state. So is Colorado. Kansas? There's a lot of farming going on in Kansas. It's only 4% or 9%. What are we doing? So here it is all broken up into states, just kind of showing the darker the blue, the more groundwater is being withdrawn. So we really are kind of this weird little anomaly. We're not a huge big state. We're a decent sized state, but we use a lot of groundwater. What are we doing? Do we just take really long showers? What, what is it? Why do we use so much groundwater here in Arkansas? And this is kind of the secret. Uh, Arkansas is the rice basket of the United States. In all these counties, this is where a whole lot of rice production is going on. Uh, and rice uses a lot of, of water. Uh, there's a little bit going on in California and there's some in Louisiana. Um, in fact, I used to think there was more up here, but I guess not. But yeah, that's that's a big reason why Arkansas uses a lot of groundwater is, is for our crop growing. And this is uh, rice, like I said, and this is cotton, so we're also a big cotton producer. Um, so we are a very heavy uh, agricultural state, and that's why we're using so much, so much groundwater, and especially because of the rice. I couldn't find this broken up for Arkansas, but however, but I've got a nice little uh, breakup of California groundwater usage uh, per their different crops. So you can kind of see the different crops, at least in California uh and what the what's using so much so much water uh, most of it is just alfalfa so that's your hay basically that you're going to feed your your cattle um i think vine is probably like uh grapes right all the wine vegetables horticulture yeah so anyway farming is a big deal uses a lot of groundwater So some terms, uh, the water table, I mentioned what the water table is. It's just this surface, that's the water table. Uh, and then you have the saturated zone, which is the area that is filled with water. It's where all the water is. Uh, there's the unsaturated zone, so the area where there isn't water. And of course, a water table can rise and lower, right? If you get more rain and more, run, or, and more infiltration, the water table will rise up. And if you have droughts and take water out of the ground, the water table can lower. Uh, you can also have something called perched water tables. So again, unsaturated zone and through here, saturated zone, here's a well, uh, the water table. A perched water table, something happened to me uh, growing up when we realized we had this growing up in uh, central Texas, uh, that we were getting our groundwater because we didn't, we were not seeing water. I lived out in the country. 
but our well was only about 200 feet down. And we kind of lived up here on the side of a, a valley, not too different from this. However, all of our neighbors and friends kind of down in this area, their uh, wells, they had to re-drill them. And they were down to like 600 feet. I remember this. They were down to 600 feet. They were really deep before they could get water. So the water table is really low uh, in that area. But we were only at 200 feet. We were way up here on the mountain. So we had to be in this little perch spot. Uh, on a perched water table to to get our water. Where we are always kind of worried, like, is it going to run out someday? Is there going to be some fracture or something? And all of a sudden it goes out, and then now we got to redrill our well and go down six or eight hundred feet. That's going to cost thousands of dollars to do. But uh, yeah, so these perch tables. So this may be some of the most important part of this lecture. Uh, what porosity, porosity is and what permeability is. This is talking about how much water a rock or sediment can hold. And also, that's porosity. And then permeability is how well can it transmit it, right? So I can have a really porous rock. Let's say I've got a piece of limestone. It's got a bunch of holes in it. I can fill those holes with water. It can be porous. But if those holes aren't connected, the water's not going to flow through that rock. So it may be porous, have high porosity, but have low permeability. So this over here, this sediment, there's no pore spaces. It's not permeable. It's, it's not porous and it's not permeable. This, however, it is a little bit porous, but it's not permeable. The water can't flow between here. These little holes don't connect. Here, however, everything kind of connects, so it's very permeable and it's very porous. Uh, different sediments and different rocks can have different porosity and different permeability. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, I'll go through it a little, uh, a little easier here in a second, but. Uh, just something for you to kind of kind of look at and understand that some things are are better than others at uh, transmitting water. And I mean, we can come down here and look at crystalline rock, right? So like a granite, so unfractured, zero to five percent. Yeah, I mean granite. You're not going to find water in granite unless it's fractured, uh, and so it's going to be very poor permeability. You're not. You don't want to go try to find water in a giant granite batholith. It's just it's not a good idea. And if you go to Kind of central west Texas, west central Texas, where there is a whole lot of granite, uh, right there at the surface. Uh, there's not very many people that live around there, because guess what? Where are you going to get your water from? You going to drill a hole into the granite? You're going to have some pretty bad luck trying to find water. So, uh, different rock types, different sediments. Uh, can be aquifers, which means they're really good at holding water. Or they can be aquitards, which means they'll kind of hold water back. Uh, sh shales, clays, and unfractured crystalline rocks make really good aquitards. So here's kind of an example. Uh, if this is kind of our, our shale through here, this is kind of an aquitard. So this will confine a, uh, an aquifer. If you have like a shale on top of it and the shale beneath it. Um, so this would be a confined aquifer. And then up here, this is an unconfined uh, because it's open to the top. There's nothing confining it. So good aquifers. Gravel will make a good aquifer. Sand, conglomerate, sandstone. Any rocks that are just heavily fractured. So even granite could hold a little bit of water if it's got a whole bunch of fractures in it because the water can get into those fractures. Uh, limestone can be a good aquifer if it's been dissolved a little bit, if you've got holes in it. You guys remember saying some of the limestones are very blocky, but if you drop some acid on it, it'll burn a hole through it. Uh, and if you've got holes in a limestone, you can transmit water through it. Some aquitards that withhold a lot of flow are clays, uh, shales, igneous rocks, metamorphic rocks, you know, crystalline things. Um, they're going to be aquitards. The water is not going to flow through them. Movement of groundwater is typically slow. It takes a while to move. 
and it's also dependent upon what it's going through. So a water through a sandstone or through a sand may actually move kind of slowly uh, compared to a really permeable limestone, right? You, you guys have, you know about what caves are. Uh, if you have a limestone, it's got a whole bunch of caves in through it. I mean, the water can just go rushing through those caves and it can move really fast. Uh, whereas it takes a while for water to move through through sand. Uh, this also depends upon the slope uh, of the water table. So if you have your recharge area, which we had a picture of that earlier, but if, if it rains on here, uh, on top of this little mountain, um, and you have the water table that kind of follows the, the surface, or sort of parallels the surface a little bit, but you have a little bit of a slope here, the groundwater will actually move with that slope. It'll kind of move down the mountain a little bit. Uh, and this will happen, the water will move here a lot quicker, a lot more quickly than it will if it hits the top and then just ends up going way down. This just kind of, this water ends up sitting here for a long time. Wells. So wells are fairly important. We use wells to try and understand uh, groundwater and what it's doing. It's important because we use it for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, you may have heard me mention about monitoring wells in class. Monitoring wells are places I would go as an environmental geologist and I would take samples of the groundwater. Um, but a water table uh, can actually be drawn down if you pump enough water out of your aquifer. So let's let's take a look at that. So here we have water table right there. Here's your saturated zone. Here's all their water. Got a little well right here. It looks like they're pulling out some water. Got another well over here. And look at it. There's all this dry land. Well, let's say I come in and I put this big well in here. It's really deep and I want to spray water all over this area to make a golf course. So that's what I do. Well, when you draw down that uh, when you pump out that much water, you can draw down the water table and these folks that are living over here, all of a sudden, their wells will dry up if they're not deep enough. And this is something that actually can be a frequent problem in a lot of places where industries will come in or uh, you know, move next to a neighborhood that's on well water and they'll, they have to use gallons and gallons and gallons for whatever their business is, and they'll end up drawing down the water table for everybody else uh, around them. So uh, this drawdown uh, versus recharge, let me go back to this. This takes a little while for this water to move if this isn't very permeable, right? So if this is a sandstone or a sand and this is kind of a slow movement, you can draw the water table down and it may take a long time to rebound back up to where it was uh, before. And over time, you may pump it down too long, which is what's happened a little bit in the middle of uh, the country and some of the major aquifers that are kind of going through the Great Great Plains. Oh, is that not going to play? That's not going to play, is it? Well, I'll probably show this in class. Oh, oh, there it goes. So, in 1986, Congress directed the USGS to regularly report uh, on groundwater level changes. Uh, basically, the, the United States Geological Survey went and started measuring the groundwater levels year after year uh, in these aquifers. So they went and drilled some wells and they measured these things to see the changes. And it's been going on since 1986. So we can measure how these the levels of these aquifers are uh, changing. So here you see these aquifers. This is the area. So we're in northern Texas here. And you can see this drawdown as it gets redder and redder and redder. That aquifer is getting shallower and shallower. So that aquifer at some point, is, it's going to go dry. It's not recharging fast enough to be used. Uh, and you'll also notice uh, there's this weird, see how the animation is like, ooh, it's smooth. And it kind of gets crazy at the end. It gets crazy at the end because we started monitoring a lot more closely. We didn't just go out there once a year. We we monitor it 
all the time. And so we can get a much better, uh, higher resolution to see what the changes are, even seasonally. But these are big problems in these areas because there's a lot of agriculture and those farms uh, utilize those aquifers. When those aquifers dry up, what are those farms going to do? What are those communities that are built around those farms uh, going to do? Should they just dry up and, and move away? Should they pipe water in from somewhere else? Should you build a big old pipeline? Who's going to pay for that pipeline? Should the community pay for the pipeline? Should the farmers pay for the pipeline? Should the state pay for the pipeline? Should the federal government pay for the pipeline? Or should you just not do anything? And if you don't do anything, then that, that decreases the supply of whatever you're growing in that that area and it may raise the price of you know if let's say you're growing corn there and all of a sudden you've got thousands of acres you can no longer grow corn on because there's no groundwater to irrigate them with uh, that drives the price of corn up everywhere else and now you're paying more for your corn or you're paying more for anything that eats that corn like your cattle so these are real world problems uh from this stuff and there's there's different answers for for uh different places but you kind of get a sense for this isn't just happening here. This is happening in spots all over the planet where these aquifers are kind of getting these huge, huge aquifers are, are, aren't recharging fast enough for the water we draw out of them. And when they dry up, what, what happens? You can get a lot of upset people. You get people that don't want to pay for it. And you get people that, you know, they're, they're, they're losing their livelihood, right? They're losing everything they've got. Uh, and they've got to migrate somewhere else to try and find a job somewhere else and then wherever they migrate to those people get pissed off oh i don't want you to take my job oh go go back to where you came from figure it out so you can see that kind of conflict happening uh just with the removal of this groundwater and what are the answers to those problems i don't know it's something people have to decide on their own you have to decide what's the most expensive thing to do what's best for everybody and move on this is why it's important to vote, because you get to decide. You can vote on the pipeline, or you can vote to say no to the pipeline, and those people have to find some other solution. So here's an example of a, a good well and a poor well for drawing out water. So here you've we've got some tilted tilted rocks; they're not flat lying, uh, but we've got a sandstone in here, uh, and it's a good well because a lot there's a lot of flow that flows into this well. This is very permeable. Versus this is a shale over here. It's not very permeable. So it's kind of a poor well. If you suck the water out of this, it's just going to suck it down. It's not going to recharge very fast. This will recharge fast. This won't. If you happen to put a well into a granite, uh, you want to be sure that that well crosses a whole bunch of fractures. So these are good wells because they intersect these fractures and those fra the water in those fractures will flow down and fill up the, the well. However, if you drill all the way down into this without crossing any fractures, you're going to have a dry, poor well. Uh, this is just kind of a neat thing. It's a, it's a little bit rare, but uh, there's something called an artesian well. And it'll happen when you have an aquifer or, or a rock layer like this, a formation, if you will, uh, and it ends up being folded up. This is called a folded rock. Uh, this happens in the Awashita's, actually. It happens when this gets folded up and then it outcrops up here like this. So the only way water gets into this sandstone is by the rainfall up here. Water doesn't trickle down into these areas and get down into it this way. It's a confined aquifer. It's got a shale on top of it, shale beneath it. It's confined. But it gets recharged up here. Well, if the slope of this land comes down this way and this aquifer ends up becoming under here, if you drill a well down in the aquifer, it'll be under pressure. And you can actually get like a a, a geyser happening if you drill into a confined uh, aquifer. But these are called artesian wells and they're, they're under pressure. Um, this is a good picture to kind of describe it. If you know about hot springs down in Arkansas where they have hot springs, uh, down, down in the central part of the state. Uh, it's This is kind of what's going on with hot springs. You've got a situation like this where it rains up on these rocks and this aquifer, and then that aquifer goes way down deep where 
there's a lot of warmth, uh, and there's some igneous uh, activity down there, but it warms the water up enough, and then there's fractures going up to the surface, and that water flows up those fractures, and it's why we get those hot springs there down in hot springs. Speaking of a spring, uh, if you don't know what a spring is, hopefully you do, it's just a place where water comes out of the rock. If you ever or hiking around and you see water coming out of the ground, that's a spring. Um, I'm not too concerned that you know this, but there are different types of streams. There's gaining streams in that kind of the water tables are flowing into the streams. There's losing streams where they're basically the stream is flowing out into the water table. Um, and that's it. Uh, like I mentioned about hot springs, uh, it's where you uh, have water that can get down deep enough, interact uh, with any kind of igneous activity you have down there, you know, near nearby magma or what have you, uh, and then that water ends up getting pressurized. You know, it, it may vaporize and push, you get a big old geyser, or you get a hot spring. Uh, hot springs can be very useful. I don't want to go too much into this uh, because. Soon I'll talk to you guys about your group presentations if I haven't already. Um, and I encourage some of the groups, uh, it'd be neat if you go go into the geothermal energy and what options are there and, and where you find it. But uh, basically you can use hot water geysers or springs and you can use them uh, to drive a turbine and you can get energy out of them. Which is kind of what this is, it's sort of a, giant steam engine of, uh, of sorts so you yeah 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 i'll let you look at this and if somebody wants to present on it later and do this you can do that so there's a whole science called environmental science that deals very very heavily with groundwater contamination that's not the only thing they do but it's a big part of what they do uh, and it's something i used to do uh, as a job and if any of you are interested in becoming geologists one day uh, this is kind of the job you'll likely end up in if you just get a bachelor's in geology. Uh, a lot of geologists have masters and PhDs for doing other types of work, but the environmental industry just requires, usually just requires a bachelor's degree, uh, and you end up dealing a lot with uh, groundwater pollution. And it can be pretty fascinating what can kind of dictate uh, groundwater pollution and, and how pollutants can move through the ground. Uh, because as you can see here, like here's the water table. You've got a sandstone, right? This whole area is just kind of a sand. And you've got some kind of granite or something down here. Well, a light pollutant like gasoline will just move along the surface of the water table. Or you might have something that's heavier than the water. It'll go, it'll migrate all the way down to the rock and then move on the slope of the rock. And not necessarily the slope of the land or the slope of the water table. So kind of a, a crazy thing. Uh, there's a whole science that goes into you know how you clean this stuff up and how do you remove this stuff and it's it's sometimes it's as simple as you dig it up uh, other times you you put in wells to draw it out uh, other times you inject certain types of microbes that can help eat it uh, it's, it's kind of neat um so different kinds of pollutants uh, there's zillions there's pesticides herbicides fertilizers uh landfill stuff uh there's whenever i would test groundwater just getting one sample to test for all the different types of contaminants i would need like 20 different jars uh, because there's all sorts of different types of contaminants that can potentially exist uh in groundwater from from you know different types of fuel uh to to, to like you know grease oil or just grease um, there's just a whole lot of, of different types. I don't want to name off all the names because they're just basically just big chemicals um, like this one. This this is a fairly important one that's very deadly. Uh, it's, it's abbreviated PCBs, but it's uh, polychlorinated benzene. Um, you can also get groundwater contamination from acid mine drainage, uh, where you go mine places and then the kind of the water coming out of those mines can be very acidic and can damage the environment. Radioactive waste, of course, oil and gasoline. These are kind of the, the, the big two. Uh, not to get too much into environmental science, because you can go take an environmental geology class. We have an environmental geology class here at NWAC. Um, <clears throat> but if you learn about the history of the kind of the environmental movement, 
Uh, it sort of happened in the 60s where we really started paying attention to the environment. Well, people before that, and I, I kind of forgive them for this because they just didn't, people just didn't know better. They didn't have the education. We just didn't know. Uh, you know, you they just dump used oil anywhere. You know, it's no big deal. Go to your backyard, dig a hole, dump the oil. It's gone, right? Out of sight, out of mind. People didn't know that this gets into the groundwater and can move along. People can drink it. It'll give them cancer or whatever. Uh, so there's a lot of cleanup that's still being done about all the messes that were made before uh, the environmental revolution of the, the 60s. Um, to get a little bit more into that, the different types of pollution sources, you can have what's called point sources and non-point sources. So a point source would be like, oh, here's a factory and they're, they're uh, you know, they've got a culvert, they got a big old pipe that just dumps it straight into the river. That's a, that's a point source that's happening right there. That's where the pollution is coming from. Non-point sources would be like croplands that use uh, pesticides and it just flows off the entire farm and all the farms in the area. So that's like a non-point source. Uh, pollutants migrate in groundwater. Nice thing these days, and I, I work a lot with this uh, with my day job, but um, landfills are regulated and designed. They're very expensive because they're lined with special systems uh, that can be monitored and that can be, um, you can actually, there's pipes that go through these and you can actually remove the water uh, under these landfills. But uh, so you don't have this, you don't have any kind of contamination, hopefully. Uh, but you can get polluted water coming in landfills and that, that plume will kind of move along depending upon the direction of groundwater flow. So if let's say you are you want to buy some cheap land and it's near a landfill, uh, you're like, hey, I, I can deal with living by a landfill. That's not going to bother me. You might want to make sure which way the groundwater is flowing and just buy land that's on the uphill side or on the kind of upflow side of that, that groundwater. You'd want to buy a house over here, over here. Maybe not want to buy a house over here, especially if you're planning on getting water out of the ground. In general, I'd say don't live anywhere near a landfill and plan on uh, drinking the groundwater. Just, just as a precaution. I kind of already pointed at this uh, and what's going on with it. Uh, septic tanks. So a lot of people have septic systems. Their, uh, you know, their toilet doesn't go out to the city sewer. It it uh, it goes out into a septic system. And the way that works is you're, you know, you flush your waste down the drain or it goes down your sink or whatever, and it goes out to kind of a big 500 gallon holding tank. And there's these lines that go off the tank, and slowly those uh, lines get pressurized and they sort of inject the water back into the, the ground and it gets purified there, hopefully. Uh, I say hopefully because certain types of uh, soils or, or, or sediments and rocks do a better job at purifying that, that water. So it kind of goes into your septic tanks first. The microbes that are in your septic tank kind of process everything and then it kind of gets pushed out over time. Uh, and hopefully very quickly it gets um, filtrated and it's actually clean water again. So this is an example of, of an issue with that. Uh, be wary of building a house down slope of people that have septic systems. If you're going to put a well in to drink your water, kind of dangerous game to play. Uh, if you have like crystalline fractured rocks where it can't be filtered like this picture up here and it just flows very quickly through there, uh, you can have a contaminated well. Arkansas is very much like this. Even though we've got sedimentary rocks underneath our feet here, it's a limestone and it's very, very porous. Uh, so water, sorry, very, very permeable. So water can move through it very quickly. Contaminated water can move through it very quickly before it gets um, fixed. Another issue you can have with groundwater uh, withdrawal is that water is taking up space. If you've got a sediment and it hasn't turned into a rock yet, uh, you remove all that water, that sediment can subside or it can compact. And 
this is a big problem actually I went to I did my master's at LSU and it was a huge issue there and you hear about oh sea levels rising and, and you know New Orleans is going to be underwater someday and these kind of things well it's not just that sea levels rising down there it's that the land is subsiding they've got this kind of triple threat down there of one yes sea levels rising uh, two there's not enough sediment being brought in down the Mississippi River anymore. We've dammed up the Mississippi River a lot, so the the delta is not being replenished uh, as quickly as it used to. So that land, it, it's not a rock. It's just mostly sand and silt down there. It's still compacting, so it's lowering itself. Plus, there's a lot of people that live down there. They're pulling water out of the ground for residential purposes, for agricultural, for industrial. And so that's also causing the ground to subside. So not only is sea level rising on its own, but the ground is dropping really quickly. And in some places, I think it's at a rate of uh, a few centimeters every year. Just quite a bit when you think about it. Uh, the act of pumping water out of a well can actually draw in contaminants, right? There wasn't a slope here before, but now that you're pumping water out of that well, you've created a slope and you can actually bring in other stuff around the area. You may have a well upslope of some outhouse or, or, or sewage area and you think, oh, it's down slope. I don't have anything to worry about. But if you're pumping water out of your well, it's not recharging fast enough. You can actually draw that sewage into your well. No bueno. Um, another big issue and this, this, this really is a, a big deal. Um, there's sea level rise going on uh, around the world. It's, it's happening. It's easily measurable and you can observe it. Uh, if you live on an island and you have a well, so you know it'll still rain on the island and the rain is still fresh water, and you'll end up getting a, a fresh water lens that kind of sits with that island to where you can drill down and still get fresh water. However, as sea level rises, uh, that salt water will start to kind of push that freshwater lens out, and that seawater will kind of infiltrate a little bit, and it'll end up ruining everybody's wells because everybody's pumping for water, and they'll actually pump too much of that fresh water out, and they'll draw in the salt water, and we get what's called salt water intrusion. And this will ruin entire communities because all of a sudden their drinking water is gone. And now it's salt water coming out of all their taps. What do you do? Well, not much you can do. Uh, this is just an extreme example uh, in the San Joaquin Valley where they've actually kind of measured like the land surface used to be up here in 1925. There's been so much groundwater withdrawal and subsidence, and now in 1955 it's down here, in 1977 it's down here. I kind of wonder where it's at today. Caves. So caves form by uh, groundwater moving through limestone, and that groundwater is a little bit acidic. It'll dissolve the uh, the limestone away, and that's how we get uh, a lot of the caves that that we see, especially around here uh, in Arkansas. Well, probably the most famous cave around here is Devil's Den, and if that one's unfortunate in that it's actually not a limestone cave. It's just a bunch of fractures and. Uh, mostly sandstone. But when you see these pretty cave formations, the stalactites and stalagmites, uh, these are areas of, uh, of limestone caves where they, they've just been dissolved out. This kind of shows what's going on. Uh, you have groundwater, your, your water table is up high, groundwater comes in here, it's a little bit acidic, enough to actually get into the fractures and kind of uh, chemically weather out those areas and, until you get a cave. And then the groundwater, the, the water table later on drops for some reason um, <clears throat> and opens up those caves. If you're ever wondering how to remember the difference between stalagmites and stalactites, I'm not going to test you on this stuff. But uh, I always remember mites as mounds. Stalagmites are mounds, so they're on the floor. And stalactites hold on tight. They're on the ceiling. That's kind of the trick I use. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on these things because they're they're you know they're neat features that exist in caves, but they don't really affect that much. Uh, one thing they are really good for is is basically what these are. Is it's uh, 
it's limestone that's re-precipitating uh, in these caves. And it can tell you a lot, of, a lot about the climate of that cave. So these things form over hundreds and hundreds of hundreds, maybe thousands of years. I can go in there. Uh, I can do some isotopic sampling, not, not for age dating. I mean, I, I suppose I could try to age date it. But I go in there to look at the uh, stable isotope ratios, and it can tell me a lot about the temperature of that cave. And the neat things about caves is they maintain a temperature of the, the average airly temperature outside. So if we go dig in the dirt uh, outside and take the temperature like three feet down in the dirt, it's going to be or maybe six or ten feet. It's going to be about the same average temperature that you feel in the air year round. And around here, that's about 56, 58 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Well, these stalagmites and stalactites will represent that in their, uh, in their isotopes. So you can see the different changes in temperature over, over time. It can tell you something about how the climate has changed over the thousand years it took that, that cave formation to, to form. So they can be really useful tools and figuring out what's happened uh, uh, during the time that that thing grew. Yeah. So where you have areas that have a lot of limestone, uh, like here in Northwest Arkansas, uh, you can get what's called a karst topography. And it's characterized by rolling hills, disappearing streams, sinkholes. Uh, our topography art around here isn't super quote karsty, um, but there's it's definitely still a lot of limestone involved with with what's going on around here. And when you get karst topography, you can get these sinkholes, uh, and you deal with groundwater issues like what we deal with. So this is, and if we go on the field trip, we'll uh, we'll get to see uh, something like this. Uh, there, this is an unweathered piece of the Boone limestone, or the Boone formation. And in the Boone formation, you've got limestone, and you've got a whole bunch of chert. There's all these chert nodules, so it's kind of like half limestone, half chert. Well, if you chemically weather out all that limestone, that chert is still kind of there to hold the structure. And so you get all these gaps in through this formation, and water can flow through there really easily, like I was saying before. But there's, you, it's not hard to imagine. So be careful if you're on well water around here. Know how far your well is. If you guys actually uh, are interested in that, uh, we can try to take a look at it. If you, want, if you want to tell me what your certain situation is and how far your well is down and where exactly you're at and if you should really be worried about like contaminants coming into your well. Because generally the, the suggestion is, is get below the boon formation if you are drilling uh, a water well. Or be sure you're far away from everybody else. Um, if you know. If you've heard about the hog farm out near in uh, Newton County, that's uh, near the Buffalo River, this had a big part to do with that whole uh, fiasco. I've been, in, I don't want to say I was involved with that hog farm stuff at all, but I was kind of adjacent to it. And so I kind of got to see it firsthand and learn all about, you know, really what went on with that. So if you're curious about what went on with that hog farm, um, I can kind of give you a little bit of background information in class. Just kind of ask me about it. So here's kind of representation of how these kind of karst systems work, or, or, or limestone, or dolomite. It can also be dolomite, um, which was, if you remember, that rock that uh, chemically weathers a little bit. Not nearly, it doesn't as fizz nearly as much as limestone, but it'll still fizz uh, if you put uh, hydrochloric acid on it. But <clears throat> you've got a, a house here. They've got a little septic system, and there's their drain field, and it'll end up going down one of these holes and ends up flowing through here really quickly without being uh, treated just by flowing through some sort of sediment or, or other rock type where it slowly moves through there and over time it'll just end up treating itself. Um, and so this can flow down somewhere else, come out as a spring or it may flow down into where your uh, well is. Here's the sinkhole where somebody used it as a trash dump. This is definitely a problem in Northwest Arkansas where people just Oh, there's a gully out behind my house. Nobody will know. I'll just dump all my trash back there. Who cares? Well, water can move through that stuff. It can get down to these karst systems and show up somewhere else where all of a sudden you've got pollution and you don't even know where it came from. 
And I think that's good. Uh, yep, I'll see you in class.